Originally named Backrub, Google search engine commenced in 1998 with the desire to take over the world. Well, actually, it wasn't really. Um, it was to organise uh, the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful. Taking over the world is just a nice side hustle for them. Um, 25 years later, around 99,000 searches are conducted on Google every second. Around 8.5 billion every day. Google holds around 92% of the global search market with 63% of people using the Google web browser. In 2023, the most searched for news report around the world was the war in Israel and Gaza. The most searched for movie was Barbie. And the most searched for recipe was bibimbap, a Korean-based meal with meat and vegetables, in Australia, the most searched for news item was the Optus outage. The most searched for movie was Oppenheimer. And the most searched for recipe, Coronation Quiche. But where do you go when you want to search for good? Well, according to Google, there are about 24,220,000 results that you can look up. But as we discover today, there can only be one. Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to delve into your word today, as we look afresh at some of the, the, the things that you said, the, the interactions that you had with others, Jesus, you invite us to engage with you. Holy Spirit, would you wash over us, whether we're listening to you in the auditorium, over Zoom, on a recording, that today might be an opportunity for you to speak to us afresh and that we would respond to the things that you're saying to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as of 2024, the most searched for thing on Google is apparently YouTube, which shows that we are very keen on being entertained. And as much to the disappointment of all the cats out there, cats are not the most searched for thing on YouTube. It is ASMR. It's the most searched for term on YouTube. So for those who have better things to do in their life than to search for ASMR, what does it mean? It means autonomous sensory meridian response. It's that tingling sensation that usually begins on your scalp and moves down the back of your neck to your spine. According to Coromo, ASMR will help you fall asleep in 25 minutes, which she defines as instant sleep. That just goes to show that instant coffee is more powerful and quicker than instant sleep every time. But for 2,000 years, before Google and YouTube, a rich young influencer asked questions about life, eternity and the universe and, and how you can achieve a good life. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. If you've got a different translation, I am sure you'll be able to follow just fine. Mark 10, 17. Now, Jesus has been on the north, north um, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And he's now making his way down towards Jerusalem in the lead up to the Passover festival, where he will celebrate it with his disciples for the final time before going to the cross, which we remember on Good Friday. Jesus has been traveling with his disciples for almost three years and from over that time he's developed a reputation <coughs> Pardon me. for the religious establishment. Jesus was an enigma and at times a troublemaker, a disturber of the peace. For the marginalized, the downtrodden, Jesus was a soothing balm. And for the populace, Jesus was an entertaining and educational person, someone who God had empowered to do miracles and who gave out heavenly wisdom. 
So it's little wonder that people came to talk to him, asking him about the meaning of life, the universe and everything. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, we read these words. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, drawing from Matthew and Luke's account, we discover that this man is a young man, a rich ruler. He evidently belonged to the aristocratic land-owning elite on the eastern side of the Jordan River in an area or a region known as Perea. Well-connected, well-respected. He learns that Jesus is passing through on his way to Jerusalem, so he comes running. A question has been burning in his mind for some time, and he has been searching for the answer. Overcome by the occasion of meeting Jesus, a man of such outstanding reputation, a young man kneels before Jesus and addresses him as good teacher. There is nothing ordinary about this greeting. It is altogether unique in the Gospels. The man has a deep respect for Jesus and sees him as a person who can speak with authority on Jewish matters of theology. So to this good teacher, the man asks the ultimate question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know about you, but can you imagine a better question for Jesus to be asked? Like, talk about a gift horse. Imagine someone approaching you and saying, Hey, hi, I know you're a Christian. Can you tell me how to have eternal life? So Jesus stops, sits down with the man and pulls out his bag of responses that he can come up with. Two ways to live? No, maybe not. Four spiritual laws? Maybe a chick trap? Christianity Explained, oh, maybe not in this one. Um, Alpha, Roman Road, oh, that's right. Saul needs to be converted and become Paul before he writes to the Romans. So, yeah, I'm getting a bit of my head myself there. All right, okay, what else do I have? Um, Then Jesus reaches into the depths of his bag of responses to this spiritual seeker and then cracks the seal of a question that almost seems like a rebuff. Why do you call me good? Jesus asks. Only God is good. Only God is truly good. Now, I can imagine the disciples gasping as they spit out their salted caramel soy lattes at Jesus' response. Here is someone who would have, they would have all loved to have seen join their team. He was young, he was rich. He was hungry to preserve his place in eternity with God. What kind of question are you asking, Jesus? Why do you call me good? Now, we could easily mistake this as a rhetorical question, but there is something deeper going on here in Jesus responding as he did. Let's follow the logic for a moment. The man comes to Jesus, recognising Jesus, not just as a good teacher, but a teacher full of goodness. And surely such a good person must be going to inherit eternal life. Because don't really good people inherit eternal life? And spending time with Yahweh God for all eternity? So, so Jesus, what have you found to be the secret? What did you do that I must also do to also inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus wants to rattle those assumptions and their logical conclusion and bring it to a logical conclusion. All good people go to heaven, have eternal life. But who is good enough? Who is totally pure, truly good? Well, only God. Is good. Now, if only God is good, then who gets to go to heaven, have eternal life? Only God. So no one gets to have eternal life? Well, let's just double check to see whether you've been good enough, as Jesus continues in verse 19. But to answer your question, Jesus says, 
You know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all these commands since I was young. Now, Jesus doesn't deny this man's goodness. In fact, Jesus adapts the bar for this man. The Ten Commandments talk about not coveting another's spouse or another's possession. But because this man's rich, it's probably not much of a temptation as would be cheating an employee or another business person out of what they were owed. That abuse of power or authority would have been more of a temptation to the rich. The man responds, I have obeyed. I have carefully guarded my heart not to do these things. The, the, the laws of the Torah are important and I have strived to live them out. Jesus sees the earnestness of this man's heart and the sincerity of his seeking. With love-filled eyes, Jesus reaches out and places a hand and places it on the man's shoulder and then pauses and looks deeply into his eyes. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing that you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell your possessions and give all the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus doesn't try and spare his feelings or avoid offending someone, but candidly speaks the truth. It's not one rule for some and a different rule for everyone else. Jesus does not offer a, a, a special way through, an easier way for the, for the community's elite, those ones that were blessed as we read in our passage in our Bible reading earlier. Jesus will not play favourites no matter how much he loves them. Five powerful verbs cut through the distraction um, for doing this, uh, the distraction of what it means to do for this spiritual seeker. What must I do for eternal life? Go, sell, give, come, follow. Go back, tidy up your affairs, sell what you have, the things that will distract you from your focus. Give. Give to those on the margins, the voiceless, the powerless, the poor. Then come. Come back to me and follow. Follow me. Radical discipleship is edgy. It challenges to the core of our being and shines a spotlight on what is truly important to us. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad for he had many possessions. Seeing him walk away, Jesus thinks, oh, maybe I was a bit harsh. You know, oh, hang on a second. Look, it's, it's okay. You know, you, you don't have to worry about doing all of that stuff. Maybe just give away a little bit and, and, and then come and follow me. And you can follow me on the weekends, but don't worry about during the week. That's okay. You know, you can do your own thing during the week. It, it, and if following me is not your jam, then at least you'll have your land and your possessions to fall back on. And, and at least you can go back to doing good. And maybe you might be good enough. Jesus loves the rich young member of the elite who was an influencer in his hometown. Jesus loves him as the young man turns his back on Jesus and trudges away, looking for an easier way for eternal life. You know, today we have people looking for the secret. We have people who will go to, um, go to cause, courses or self-help seminars. We have people who will spend their life savings, selling what they have and walking away to make a new life in a foreign land, to follow some guru, to see their life transcend and our, to, to see our life transcend our, our earthly desires of the flesh and the wanderings of our mind. We have people think that 
if I can just master this or that, then, then I'll be good enough. Others think that as long as they can check off the list, I haven't killed someone, I haven't had an affair, I haven't coveted anyone else's stuff, I, I, I'm fine. I even pretend to be excited when, when a, a friend of mine has a new job or a new car or a new house or, or the latest phone. I'm not a shoplifter. I don't even cheat on my tax returns. I don't lie. Or was that a lie? I don't tell big lies anyway. You know, those ones that will hurt someone else. You know, I, I get the desire to do a, a checklist. I get the desire to have a scorecard of good enough. During my time of study, the most frustrating aspects of the different things that I did in study, whether it be a degree, a graduate diploma, a master's degree, was doing a certificate level course. A certificate in um, assessment and workplace training. You bust your butt. You try and do all the assessment and do it really well and all you get in return is a competent or not yet competent. I mean, come on, you've got to give me something more than that than just a, a pass or a fail. It's human nature to want to know what good enough is, what it's really like. Surely there's more to eternal life than being good enough or not yet good enough. What, what is the benchmark? And, and how can you help me to achieve it in my efforts? Who decides what is good enough? What is moral? What is right? Is it you? Is it me? Is it a political party that decides? Maybe it's the judge in our courts in the land until someone appeals the decision and the judge is ruling and it's overturned and a new decision is made. Perhaps it's the International Court of Justice. However, even the International Court of Justice has been criticised for judges making decisions that favour states that either appoint them or have similar levels of wealth to the state that they're from. The reality is that if we measure it by human standards, it really comes down to one of two options. Either we are all ultimately good enough or no one is good enough. If we base it on human perfection or good enough. And if none of us are good enough, then our only option is to come to Yahweh God, the only one who is good enough. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he called the rich young ruler to give up his, his reliance on material things, to stop grasping for the things of this world and point scoring and instead to come and to follow Jesus. John's account puts it like this in John 3, 16 and 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Today, when it comes to the pursuit of what is good and what is good enough, when will you ever be good enough to reach and to take hold of eternity for yourself? You could spend your life chasing down Google's 24,220,000 results or you can accept God's offer of eternal life through his one and only Son, the Son of God who took on flesh and blood as the person Jesus. Jesus who died for all who would not and never be good enough so that in him we can have a restored relationship with our Creator God 
and spend eternity with him. Today, you don't have to walk away sad. Not with such love on offer for you today. Let me pray. Jesus, we recognise that in our own self, we can, on a good day, try and have a good crack at being good enough. But we also recognise that on a bad day, we can snip and gripe, we can be short with others, we can get frustrated with people cutting in front of us, we can, we can delve deep into the recesses of our, our sinful nature and tap into the brokenness of who we are. And out of that can come out stuff that we, we hang our heads in shame over afterwards. Jesus, the reality is we will never be good enough. But thank you. Thank you that you were good enough. You were the perfect son of God. You were the perfect God taking on human flesh and blood and dwelling amongst us. You were the perfect sacrifice to deal with our sin and to enable us to have a restored relationship with you, our creator. Help us to lean into that rather than trying to make it on our own. Amen. So, a few questions for us today as we reflect upon will we ever be good enough? In what ways have you been trying to be good enough? What might it mean to live under the offer Jesus makes to you today? For those of you that have been followers of Jesus for some time, what are you holding on to that pulls you away from following Jesus every day? That thing that gives that tug that takes you off course. What freedom might it bring to offer this back to Jesus?